Hey, VC, how's it going? Right, we're back in the Vinyl Community Pub. I'm John, 6-inch penis 319, and once again, I'm joined by my mate Headley, another fat beady man talking about records. Yeah, hello. <laughs> I was um, going to say something else, but I, I, I panicked. That was a little bit weird, that was. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Right. So, well, so last time we were in the pub, we had Madam Sim with us, didn't we? I know. We decided that you just can't follow it. <laughs> no, no, he's yeah, he was good, wasn't he? He's very he got a tell to tell, hadn't he? But but with with Paul, we were talking about um, you know, the importance and the romance of the seven inch single, just how, you know, jukeboxes, that's what it was all about. Mm. Playing those seven inches, the A side, the B side, you know, fantastic. So so today, on the back of that, <laughs> we're gonna talk about album tracks. Oh yeah. <laughs> Album orientated. <laughs> what is yeah. <laughs> That's it. You know, so 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 imagine Headley, we're in a pub and we've got a jukebox. I suppose it's the whole C D era of jukeboxes, isn't it? You know, yeah, where I suppose it also is. you have full albums is. on jukeboxes rather than just uh rather than just forty fives. Yeah, which means I suppose that you, you don't have to pick all the singles and, and things. That's you right. can get the, yeah. the, the the obscure uh uh you know uh, filler singles that no one liked. Well, that's it. Is it? It's just the. Uh, I mean, you, you can quite easily lose a lot of friends, couldn't you? Playing album tracks off in, in a oh, pub yeah. on a Friday night. In oh, a... this is the obscure Smiths polka number that they put on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Or nobody's going to thank you for playing a, a Rick Wakeman ten minute keyboard solo, are they? You know, on a Saturday night. No, no. no you're, you're safe with me with that one, John. Yeah, you know well, that. I'm you know that. Yeah, about that. Yeah. Right then. Okay. So, what are you drinking? Okay. Now. Right. Okay. I've got, I'm a bit parched, actually, because I haven't been drinking when we were chatting earlier. Because I've got... Now, it, it looks like a bottle of San Peregrino, yeah, which is just water. But if you look, it says cider on it. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, this, this is cider that was made by my sister from the apples in my garden. Wow. Um, and I haven't tasted it. I have no idea what it's going to be like. I thought... This is a prime example for a, a time for me to just crack yeah. it open and see what it's like. I'm not a cider drinker, <laughs> so I wouldn't mind a little glass of that. that, that, that I um, yeah, well, that. Let, uh, well, let's have a go. Let's have a go. Funny. Now, I have got a bottle of Blue Moon just in case it's horrible. <laughs> okay, sure, okay. So that's an emergency. So let's have a go. Okay, let's have a a, a whiff of it. Whoa! Yeah. Put well, that does smell like it smells like cider. It smells yeah. like cider. Okay. Got a little bit. Ha <laughs> 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 Yeah. 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 Right? yeah. I mean, I have that. no idea. I have no idea what the alcohol content is. So, <laughs> so I might be absolutely legless by the end of this. Just a little glass of it. Good. Yeah, right, go. then. right then. So, as it's only the two of us, for your quid tonight, you get... You get three plays on the jukebox. I know. It's like Christmas. It's brilliant. It is. Actually, so actually I, I, I have found this really tricky. Because because when you're doing singles, I kind of have a finite number of singles. I know, I know John's got them coming out of his armpits, but I, I I don't have a huge number. So I'm I'm kind of working my way through them. And I thought this was going to be, oh, open the door, brilliant. But it just means there's too much stuff. Yeah. I mean, look behind me. Yeah, because I've got you know it's 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 been really tricky to go which ones will I choose and then you go actually hang on well three of those on that album were singles so I don't really want to have a single but then you go oh the others aren't really there that good <laughs> that good so right then, anyway so, so what you got then so what you got so to... right first up first up uh, Elvis Costello. Mm. Uh, the Loved Ones, which should have been a single, really, because I think it's a cracking uh, mm. song. But uh, apparently he does kind of falsetto on it, and it's got lots of sort of um, production and stuff that they couldn't really replicate in a live setting. So they didn't really want to do it as a single because then they had to have performed it live and they couldn't really perform it live. So this is... I, I, what is it? I'm sorry. Uh, it's um, yeah, Imperial Bedroom from '82. Yeah, '82. This was the first album that they recorded that, uh, well, that wasn't produced by Nick Lowe. Well, after four albums, I think by Nick Lowe. Right. And this was the first one 
It's um, and I like the way it says this. It says uh, produced by Jeff Emmerich from an original idea by Elvis Costello. Um, apparently, he just he he just done a um, helped do the production work on uh, a Squeeze album. I don't know which one one it is, but he apparently he said that he didn't like the fact that everyone was saying, "Oh, it's the one produced by Elvis Costello." Oh, when right, okay. he only did some of it, you know, mm. so he wanted to make sure that Jeff Emmerich got his uh, got his um, his credit for, for doing that, oh, and man. and it's and it is the first one that they went into the studio um, without any real idea. They hadn't been playing the tracks out on the road. Um, it was and also it, getting Jeff Emmerich in, of course, who who engineered Sergeant Pepper, um, you know, with the Beatles. Um, that was what he was trying to do. This was the first time to go, what can we do in the studio? So you get sort of all kinds of different instruments on the album. But The Loved Ones, I just think, is a wonderful... I mean, it's got it's got everything you want from a from an Elvis Costello single or it's a song. It's got that sort of driving rhythm, bit of sort of, bit of sort of slightly R&B, a bit 60s. It's got that garagey kind of new wavy feel. But, and it's got the caustic lyrics... It's um, sort of a slightly de- depressing kind of talking about a has been, someone that could have been, or a, what? What do the critics make of you? But yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of Elvis Costello, and um, this album is probably, possibly my favourite by him. Actually, it's interesting that you say what you said now about the reason why it wasn't put out as a single was because they couldn't perform it live. Whereas perhaps a year or two later, that wouldn't matter, would it? You know, so if they could have made a video for it and they knew it was going to be played on MTV. You know, they don't need to play it live today for it to, to sell the single, to sell the album. Whereas that's pretty much the the sort of borderline, isn't it? 1982, just a little bit before MTV kicked in. Yeah, well, I mean, apparently uh, Costello says that um, that he can do falsetto in the studio, but he says he just can't do it out live. It yeah. just doesn't work. He's it, it, yeah, fails miserably. And I just think, yeah, a really missed opportunity of a single that I think is great. It's interesting how his voice has changed over the years, though, isn't it, Elvis Costello? Yeah. Because, he's, you know, he's he's clearly tried to develop his singing style over the years. I mean, I don't know if you know the album that he did with Burt Backrack, painted, yeah. painted From Memory, which I think is a great record. A lot of people have put off that record because of his voice. Not yeah. as songs, but because of the way that he's, he's projecting his voice, you know. So, yeah. Lots yeah, well, of well, well, in that, you know. Yeah, yeah. To tell, I mean, I'm a I'm a fan of the Juliet letters. So uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Where, where, I mean, obviously, he's he's doing something. I mean, he's it's still his voice, but you're right. He's he's trying different things, and it's not just that. You know, he's going okay. I've done the rock and roll kind of growl. What else can I do with my voice? And I suppose that's what he's doing. All these different because he's done all kinds of different styles yeah. Yeah. over the years yeah. now. You know, still waiting for his reggae album. <laughs> I'll, I'll be first in the queue when he puts it out, though. Eventually, you know. So. <laughs> I mean, Brilliant. even Willie Nelson's done a done a, a yes, reggae, yeah, album. and it's good. His is good. Yeah, yeah really good. Right, what you got then? Right, so first up for me is uh, New Order, Power, Corruption and Lies. And I'm going with the opening track, Age of Consent. Do you know it? No. No, right, okay. Well, I heard it on the radio the other day, and I was thinking, I don't think that was a single. I'm I'm sure, I listened on the radio, it sounded great. And I think, I'm sure that wasn't a single. I I went home, looked it up, it wasn't a single. And as you said with the, the Elvis tune there, it certainly should be. It's a great song, you know. Mm. 
And I just, this is a, I think this is their second album as an awarder, isn't it? I think, you know, so, um, but I, I saw an interview with um, Bernard Sumner recently and he was talking about the death of Ian Curtis, you know, so obviously when uh, Ian Curtis passed away, they decided to carry on. But as you put it, you know, incredibly naively, they put all of the, the Joy Division legacy aside. They didn't use a name. They didn't perform mm -hmm. any of the songs. You know, they didn't get another singer in. He stood up and, you know, and sang the songs, whatever. And I can't think of any other instance where a band has, has done that. You know, normally they will fall back on, on you know, what's been successful for them, what, you know, what, you know, what people mm. want. Yeah. So they yeah. just put everything aside and started again. It was a total cut off, you know, started afresh. And it's fascinating. And I say, I think that is a brilliant record. There's, it's a great album. And I think the whole, um, I think all of the records that put out throughout the 1980s are interesting. Great records, great production. And of course, you know, they've got these iconic sleeves. So timeless, they are incredible, aren't they? Timeless artwork, isn't he, though? So timeless yeah. record um, sleeves. But uh, I'm assuming this is Peter Savile. But um, yeah, wonderful stuff. But yeah, I've, I've got a bit of a soft spot for Lynn Warden. Yeah, I forgot to say actually that the the album cover. Hang on, I've lost this on the floor. Here. <laughs> I forgot to say you when you talk about the album covers, the the imperial bedroom one. It, it's in the style of Picasso, yeah. but it says it's um, called Snake Charmer and Reclining Octopus by Sal Falenza, nineteen forty two, and oh, it wow. isn't. It's it's done by Barney Bubbles. <laughs> You had me sob for a minute there. Blimey. Yeah, no, no, yes. Yeah. Barney Bubbles did that for this, and apparently, apparently, someone said, "Oh, does he not know it's just a rip off of uh, Pablo Picasso?" And he go, and Elvis, Elvis Costello was able to go, "Yeah, have you noticed? If you look in here, it says P A B L O C, so it says Pablo on it. So it's, it, yeah, there you go. Sorry, I forgot about that. Very good. You mentioned in the oh. covers, yes." What you got? Right then. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to have Down to the Station by uh, Dennis Lindy. What? I think it is Lin Lin Dennis Lindy, Down to the Station. That Doesn't that look like a prog rock album? It does. That is an absolutely yeah. terrible album cover. What is it? It's I don't know. It's, it's called Under the Eye, and it's like a light bulb fitting with a snare drum connected. I, 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 yeah. Bizarre, bizarre. The back's not much better either. A um, bit, bit trippy. But yeah, so Dennis Lindy was um, probably most famous for writing Burning Love for Elvis. Um, oh, right. Presley, 1972, sort of that, yeah. that period. Um, and he he was probably had most success as a writer. Uh, he wrote for everyone in the through the 70s and 80s and into the In fact, I think he died in 2006. But I think his last hit was he wrote uh, Goodbye Earl, which was a hit for um, the Dixie Chicks, or the Chicks as they're called now. Okay, right. Which, which upset all the, uh, the, the, the right wing right Republican Christians because they seemed to enjoy the fact that it was about, it was about these, these women who were being abused by this guy and they killed kill him. And they're not, they're not sorry about it. <laughs> he had it coming. But apparently, you know, in, in in country music, you, you, that's not a done thing. The bloke doesn't get killed. The women gets killed by a knife, you know, by a pen knife down by the by the river. Yeah. That or in every song, you know, practically. But if a bloke gets topped, it's it's a problem. Anyway, so yeah, so so he did that. Uh, and actually, he's he. I don't think he had any success with his albums. Um, they're kind of singer songwritery country kind of stuff. In fact, one of the things I think was. Which I haven't got because it's 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 gone up in value because it was sampled by uh, DJ Shadow on introducing, right? Um, so I, I can't afford that one because all the hipsters get that one. But actually, so yeah, so I haven't talked about this. So this album is a kind of a weird. So this is from nineteen seventy eight, I think. 
Yeah, 78, it's on Monument Records. And it is a kind of weird, funky, kind of modern sort of synthesizers and stuff country. It's quite odd. In fact, the, the, I think the track down to the station was was featured on the latest um, country funk. I oh, was um, it? Okay. Uh, the compilation that, that you know the one that kind of went into the more disco yeah. country stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, this one isn't disco, but it's very ahead of its time for 1978. A kind of a country sounding record. Um, really weird, sort of yeah, new wavy, <laughs> funky not disco-y country. I think you're right, though. I think a lot of prog fans were clearly very, you know, were really disappointed when they bought that record. <laughs> <laughs> record and, and it turns out to be a disco country record. I mean, Yeah, geez. I know. I know. I don't even know what's going on with that album cover. But yeah, it's a cracking track down to the station. So Okay, right. So I'm going for a bit of soul music. I've noticed that on these on these pub chats that we have, I very rarely show soul music. <laughs> it, may, it may not feel like that to you, but but I just don't <laughs> go with soul music. So I'm going with the Sweet Inspirations. This is their debut album from 1967. So, and the reason why I'm picking this is because there's a there are a couple of tracks on here which are in that sweet spot for, for, for both you and I. So it's that area of music where soul meets country. And, we, you know, when, when we're talking, we often talk about this, don't we, you know? So, yeah. and, and for me, there's, it's not just about the artist. Sometimes it's, it's particular songs which really suit either soul or country music, whatever style they're done in. So there's two on here. The first one is Let It Be Me, which, yeah. you know, I think I first heard done by... The Everly Brothers, probably. Everly Brothers, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's been done by numerous people. I know that uh, Betty Everett and Jerry Butler did a lovely version of it. I think... I think, um, I think Linda Ronstadt's done it. Yeah. What a version done by her? Bobby Gentry and Glenn Campbell, I think, did it as well. Oh, is it on that, album, on that album? That, that duets album, I'm sure yeah. did it as well. But yeah, so that, that's on here. But the song that I'm going to pick is, and which I first heard through Aretha Franklin's version, her original... Do right woman, do right man. But I know, Headley, that you are going to reference the Flying Burrito Brothers because their, well, version, can... their version is gorgeous as well, isn't it? It is. Well, I was, I was actually, I was going to say, uh, didn't I? Uh, recently, I picked up a Kitty Wells record, right? That that was produced, but well, done for for um, Capricorn Records, and it had loads of um, uh, Southern rock uh, artists all, yeah. all on it. And she does a cracking version of "Do Right Woman" on it. Oh, uh, really? Uh, well, which is really, really good. You'll have to, you'll have to listen to that. You'll have to listen to that. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's a glorious song, and I think what makes it really special is that every version that, that I've, certainly I've heard of it, it's all about the harmonies. And and this this mm. this version in particular, it really shows off their their harmonies. I, I don't know what you know about the Sweet Inspirations, but. They, I mean, during the course of their sort of, you know, the, the band's life, where the, uh, Dionne Warwick was was in the band, was in the oh, group. Right. Um, Sissy Houston was in a, at this point. So you've got a few sort of... And, that, and that's on Atlantic, is it? It's on Atlantic, yeah. So they, they recorded for Atlantic. Atlantic clearly really liked them. They put out a few, uh, three or four albums on Atlantic. They yeah. then went to Stax, made a brilliant record for Stax. And, uh, yeah, it's that, it's, that, it's that sort of, um, that southern... Southern soul, southern country crossover thing, and I think it really works. It's it's just lovely. But 
this is a great sounding record as well. And I don't think it's particularly expensive. So mm. anybody who's collecting soul music, this is definitely one to look out for. I, I certainly didn't pay too much for it, but yeah. And of course they backed Elvis as well. They were the, um, the backing group for Elvis, certainly the late sixties, early seventies. Oh, right. I actually saw them live. So I don't know if you remember about 20 years ago, they had that thing. So, you know, nowadays you have like the ABBA thing where they've got um, the holograms. Oh, you know, yes, so yes. You have yes. the other thing with the holograms. So, so back in the early 2000s, the whole deal, you had a big screen with the Elvis performance on the screen, but you had the original musicians playing the music. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, it's it's a little, little, little bit less... Uh, it's a bit more basic than the hologram, you know, sort of thing. But, it's great <laughs> this time. but as part of the band, they did have a version of the Sweet Inspiration. So, yeah, that was lovely. Oh. But, yeah, great. Good stuff. Stuff. with what you were saying with the kind of the, the crossover soul country uh i'm gonna go with um picking wild mountain berries by um uh, conway twitty and loretta lynn which was originally um i think it was for um oh what were they called peggy peggy scott and jojo benton mm. uh did the original version 1968 and that's it's one of those records on SSS, yeah. So Shelby yeah. Singleton, um, yeah. which they seem to do a lot of that kind of. It could go one way or the other. Yeah. You know, a lot of the writers would be writing. It could be a soul song. It could be a country song. And this is one of those songs. I think actually, as a result of, I think there is a version of it done by on the on the television by Glenn Campbell and. Um, Oh, who's the Harper Valley PTA? Oh, what's her oh, name? Um, Jeannie C. Riley. Jeannie C. Riley. Um, and that's really good. But the interesting thing about this song, it's it's a fun, it's a kind of a funny song. If you don't know it, it's it's a song about two people, two lovers who have been off in the in the forest, uh, getting it on, and coming back and telling everyone, "Where have you been?" They say, "Where have you been?" Oh, we've just been picking wild mountain berries. That's what we've been doing. And there's and there's a line in it that says and and we didn't go skinny dipping in the lake, and uh, on the on the TV one that Glenn Campbell and Jeannie C Riley they don't say skinny dipping they just go swimming in the lake, oh, right, okay. <laughs> which is interesting. But Loretta Lynn uh, says skinny dipping, but um, yeah. So it, it, yeah, the original one was a, a sort of a bit more of an R and B soul track, but it's still got soul to it. This one, yeah, and it is great. It is great. Um, lovely tune. But and they are great together. When you when you talk about country duets, I think Conway Twitty and Loretta Lynn are probably the pinnacle of those that really? double act. I right. think they are because he's he's got a really great voice. He's, he's, I like the one on the back. Of he had the biggest hair in country. It's not very big at this point. He got bigger, but but because he started out as a rock and roller, um, and so he's got that gruff kind of rock voice if he wants to use it and he does sometimes on this as well so yeah really like it really good tune so so she made records up to when was the last album uh Louisa Lynn? it must be only a few years ago wasn't it yeah it was probably about a year or so before she died yeah uh, i think i've got it back here somewhere yeah yeah because yeah. yeah, she she basically her last three albums i think that they that she kind of did a a little bit of what Johnny Cash did, mm. where she kind of stripped it back. Um, yeah. I think they were actually, ironically, I think they were actually produced by John Carter Cash. Uh, uh, John, John, 
John Cash, Johnny Cash's son. Yes, yeah. Um, but but yeah, they're kind of stripped back um, uh, acoustic music and stuff. In fact, I think one of them, I think she does a duet with um, Elvis Costello on one of them, actually. But um, yeah, they are. They're worth listening to. If, you, if you're not really a big fan of country, a bit like, you know, the American session for Johnny Cash kind of broke through. I think those records that, that Loretta Lynn made uh, later on, actually, might be something that would be up people's streets as well. Because she made the album with uh, Jack White as well, didn't she? Yeah. In the early 2000s, which I think yeah. is a brilliant record. It is. It is great. It's, it's really, really, really good. good. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how brave is how brave is she to do something like that? You know, the idea that you know her audience would go, Jack White, who's this? You know, it is. I mean, not, also, not... You must say from Jack White's point of view, you know, it's clear that he was a real fan when he made that record with yeah. her. He clearly understood her music and understood yeah. her her history. Yeah. Because I think the song choices are fantastic. It's a really, well, really well put together record. That is. Well, the interesting thing with that is. Is because he's got such a sort of a high voice. It yeah. flips round when they do the duets. It flips it round where she's got the lower, huskier voice, and he's oh, got the man. higher voice. It's a nice juxtaposition of the two. Yeah. If I can keep honey from letting it show. What's up, plans, Jimmy? What's up, plans? Ah, you know they won't understand. I will explain it, honey, the best that we can. They won't leave us alone. They want us to come home. We've been a busy making merry and picking wild mountain berries. We're picking wild mountain berries. That's our excuse. That's cool, yeah. But what you said before about Shelby Singleton's label. I mean, again, that's that's another. You say it can go either way. I always think if I see a record, uh, a yeah. record on the SSS, yeah. I'll I'll probably go for it because yeah. it, it might be country, but there's it, quite yeah. often they just sit in that middle that middle area, don't they? Where it's slightly country, slightly soul. I mean, the, the record that you mentioned there, I think it's a Soul Shake album, isn't it? Which has got yes, the, that's which, right. Yeah, which which is a great record. Yeah, and it, and it is natural. Na uh, it's Nashville soul music. It is. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, also that he, he Shelby Singleton was a, a very interesting guy, and he, he'd do anything for a buck, kind of thing. Yeah, and so, so you get obscure records that are kind of slightly comedic, or they're slightly, um, there's something kind of that will get people talking, you know. Often, he, I mean, I think you know, he'd, he'd like the way he would put Jeannie C. Riley in a mini skirt, you know that would be shocking for Nashville at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's a, an interesting guy. There's a really good um, episode of the uh, Cocaine and Rhinestones podcast um, where it does all about Shelby Singleton. And it's yeah. really worth listening to. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's about Jeannie C. Riley or, it, or it's, it, it is, but it's, it's, it's about Jeannie C. Riley. Yeah. 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 And that's really worth listening to because you get an idea of the type of guy he was a real sort of one of those people that, that, yeah, depending on who you've spoken to, he's either a, a great guy or an awful guy. Yeah. Put out some good records, though, so we'll go with that. Yeah, definitely good records, yeah. And I do like Wild Mountain Berries. Right. That's where I think, anyway. Now I'm going to go and pick some Wild Mountain Berries now. Uh, easy. <laughs> <laughs> How's that cider going down, anyway? I think that's why I'm going picking Wild Mountain Berries, see what I can do with those. <laughs> this is, is good right? stuff. Is it right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As as a non cider drinker, it's all right. Is it sweet or you know, where's it? Been? It is sweet. It is sweet. Yeah, mm. got a bit of a kick as well. Mm. It's not cloudy, so I'm not. It's not not like dangerous scrumpy. Yeah, you know. The, oh, the, the... I tell you what, I love a glass of dangerous <laughs> scrumpy. I really do. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I've seen a dangerous scrumpy since the last time I went to a music festival yeah. and saw some guy carrying around a, a sort of a, a petrol canister with it in. <laughs> mm. 
Right, okay. Right. Right, so next up for me. Oh, I forgot you've still got another one to do. Yeah, I've got one for you. I was ready, to, I was ready to go. <laughs> Down in your drink. Time I was. Please. I'm right, right I've, got, I've got a pick left, right. Marcia Griffiths, right. So this is her album, Sweet Bit of Love from, I don't know, mid-70s or something. So Marcia Griffiths, is, of course, one of the great reggae singers, you know, so she had a, well, she's still got a wonderful a solo career, but she was one of the I3s, of course, who were um, backed Bob Marley and the Whalers, so along with um, Rita Marley and uh, Judy Moore. Um And of course, for me, though, probably best known for the records that she made with Bob Andy in the early 70s of Bob and Marcia, Young, Gifted and Black. We, oh, know, yeah. We were talking before about the romance of the seven-inch single. For me, that is a perfect seven-inch, you know. Young, Gifted and Black, it just makes me, takes me back to being a kid. It's a perfect... When you were Young, Gifted and Black. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, not necessarily the... Uh, it all went message. wrong for you, didn't more, it? <laughs> more the song than the, than the message itself. But yeah, it's oh, it's a great. You've had too many of those sliders already. <laughs> That's what it is. But uh, oh yeah, great song. Anyway, but this what I'm picking up here is uh, her tune "Here I Am, Baby," which is a cover of the Al Green song. And so, and strangely, it's not a. So it's strangely, it's not a uh, a reggae tune at all. It's it's done in a straight soul soul style, but with a, a Jamaican reggae vocal, and it's beautiful. Right. She's got a great voice. I, I think you've got some of her records, haven't you? Have you got the yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, she's got a great really voice. Like really yeah, like that. Really like that. Great, great record. And and again, one of those. If you see a record with Marcy Griffith's name on it, buy it. They're always good. There you go. There you go. Oh, I'm glad we stuck around for that. Mm. Thanks for that. We get somebody else down the pool with us next time. I think than... it is. I think it is. I think, yeah. I think uh, familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> yeah. As they say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what happens now? I don't know. Go home, don't we? The only yeah, thing... we are home. We are home. The, the, the only the thing is, though, is that, you know, so what the blokes do. So you're the other half, she's away. She One is, yeah. Is working. So all, all you can do if you're a bloke at home on your own is is go to the pub, isn't it? Oh, right. I hadn't thought about that. That's what happens, isn't it? Well, my local's closed, so... Yeah. So I'm stuck here drinking my, <laughs> my sister's cider. So is, does your sister regularly uh, brew her own uh, alcohol? This is the first... It, well, it's, it's the first I've, I've had of it. Right. Um, I don't know. She's she, she's she's always got something on the go. She's sort of, you know, she'll come, but she'll say, "Oh, I've made you some some felt slippers," you know, or or she's crocheted something, you know, a a, a cap or something. There's something going on always with my sister. Does she not like you? 
Is that why she's making you wear felt slippers with a cat? <laughs> she so knows I'm the only the sucker that will wear them. Deadly. Felt slippers and a cap. This has been crocheted. Jesus. I know. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. I just thought it was really nice. Oh, well. Right then. Right. This hasn't right. been awkward at all. No, not at all. Right. See you next time. 